The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. In the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States, nearly four million members are banded together to build better futures for themselves and their families. Their reasons for becoming Equitable Society policyholders are many. But certainly, among the most unselfish and far-sighted Equitable Society members are those parents who have seen the wisdom of an Equitable Education Fund. Fathers and mothers, in just 14 minutes, the Equitable Society will tell you how to make sure that your children get the funds necessary for the education you want them to have through an Equitable Education Fund. Tonight's FBI file, The Innocent Fugitive. The mind of man is an elastic thing, and nowhere is that flexibility better illustrated than in the endless variety of crimes he commits every day. In every 24-hour period, there are more than 4,000 major crimes committed somewhere in these United States. Those crimes range from armed robbery to murder. Some of those crimes are comparatively new, but murder, the deliberate killing of a human being with malice aforethought, is as old as the history of the world. In fact, one of the most despicable characters in America's current legion of criminals is a throwback to the very earliest days of recorded time. In that era, rulers hired their soldiers, soldiers who were available to the nation which paid them best. They were called mercenaries. Today, their 20th century criminal counterpart is likewise a member of no organization. He, too, is available to the highest bidder. His job is to murder for money. Tonight's file opens in a lavish apartment located in the downtown section of a Midwestern city. It is evening. In the living room of this sweet Arthur White, prominent local citizen, is showing home movies to a friend. Yeah. Hey, see that, Ed? That's the lake where we went fishing. You catch anything? (laughs) You just keep your eye on the screen and you'll see. Yeah, how about another drink, Ed? No, thanks. Ah, there's the boat we used. You see it? Yeah, it's a beauty, huh? Is that you? Huh? Oh, no, 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 no. That fellow was my guide. Oh. <laughs> yeah, there's me now, see? Mm-hmm. You ask about fish. Just look at those rainbow trout. Who caught them? I did. That's a legal limit up there. You're not allowed to catch any more. <laughs> and you know me. I always stick by the rules. Mm-hmm. Hey, look. Look, there's Freddy waving at the camera. Hello, Freddy. <laughs> uh, say, Mr. White. <laughs> uh, yeah? Is this what you brought me up here to see? Uh, no, 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 we're coming to that right now. Okay. Uh-huh, now, here we are. Now, look at that place closely. That house? Uh-huh. I'm pretty sure that's where he is. That's where who is? John Williams. Who's he? The man I want you to kill. The next morning at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is approaching the desk of Agent Glenn Peters. Hello, Glenn. Hi, Jim. Hey, when'd you get in? I signed in this morning. Well, the SAC told me you were coming. Hey, where you been? Well, I was in Salt Lake City for a while, then I moved out to the San Francisco office. Uh, I understand we're working together, Jim. What's the case? Well, I'd better start at the beginning, huh? Mm-hmm. Did you ever hear of a man named John Williams? No, not that I know of. Three and a half years ago, he was the local city treasurer. One morning, he disappeared. With city funds? Uh, That's right. When his books were examined, it was found that they were $80,000 short. Well, isn't the city bonded against a loss like that? Yes, yes, they are. Well, how do we get in on a local case, Jim? Well, when Williams couldn't be found, the police requested us to cooperate with him. We sent out a flyer on Williams and found out that he'd taken a plane to El Paso, Texas. 
From there, he went across the border into Mexico. That was the last trace we had of him. Well, how about the Mexican police? At our request, they started to search at Juarez for Williams, but all they could find was that he had left Juarez by car. What did he do? Buy a car in Mexico? No. No, according to their report, someone was waiting for him at Juarez, and they drove away, down south together. You say that that was three and a half years ago. Yeah, that's right. Well, how come we're suddenly getting active on the case again? We got a report from the immigration department that a plane was taken from an airport in Mexico, flown across the border to an airfield in this country where it was abandoned. Mm -hmm. Now, upon examining this plane, immigration officials found a thermos jug in the cockpit. They wrapped it carefully, sent it on to Washington for a fingerprint examination. Mm -hmm. Now, the fingerprints proved to be those of John Williams. Well, any idea where he could be headed? Not yet, Glenn. But let's go through the record, see if we can get some kind of a lead. Easy, Ed. This is the place. Okay. Yeah, stop right here. Uh, looks like we'll have to run for it. Uh-huh. Okay, here we go. Uh. Ah. <laughs> Haven't done this in years. Get spoiled in the city. Too many comforts. I'll still take them. <laughs> You're not much of a country boy, are you, Ed? Uh... <laughs> ah. You know, when I was a kid, Ed, nights like this, we'd stay out for hours, just feeling that soft summer rain beat. Yes? Hello, Betty. What? It's me, Arthur White. Oh, oh of course. Hello, Arthur. <laughs> I, I didn't know who it was standing there in the dark. Come in. Thank you, thank you. You mind if my chauffeur comes in, too? Of course not. Thank you. Go ahead, Ed. Uh, yes, sir. I hope you don't mind this intrusion, Betty. Why, Arthur? I was you... on my way to the lake to do some fishing when this storm came up, so I said to Edward here, I've got a good friend in the neighborhood. Maybe we can impose on her for an hour or so until it stops raining. It's no imposition. You know that, Arthur. <laughs> and take off that coat. It's soaking wet. Well, I guess maybe I should at that. I've got a dry one in my bag in the car. Edward, uh, w- would you get it for me, please? Yes, sir. Here, let me have your coat. All right. There oh, we are. I'll uh, just put it right over here. <laughs> there. Ah. Betty, this place looks lovely. Thank you. You know, I envy you this country life. I do enjoy it. <laughs> you heard from John recently? Well, not for a couple of months. Well, that's a fine way for a man to treat his sister. <laughs> well, he never writes very much. How about you? Do you write him often? I try to write about once a week. Uh Uh-huh. Uh, send him this the next time you write him. With my regards. Thank you, Arthur. You've certainly been nice to John, giving me money all the time to send him. (laughs) After all, he was a member of my organization. A good friend, too. You've certainly proven that. (laughs) When did John write last? Well, just two months ago. On my birthday. Did he say anything about wanting to see you again? No. Anything about coming back to the States? No. Are you sure, Betty? Yes, of course. Look, Arthur, you sit down here and make yourself comfortable. I'll go out and make you some hot tea. Uh And a couple of sandwiches, maybe, too? (laughs) Fine, Betty, fine. Who's there? It's me, John. Oh. Don't turn on the light. I heard a car pull into the driveway a little while ago. Who's here, Betty? Arthur White. Oh, he must have heard that I came back. He doesn't know that you're here. How do you know? Because he gave me a hundred dollars to mail to you. Well, that might be one of his tricks. Maybe. What's he doing here? He said he was just passing by when the storm came up. He was on his way to go fishing. I don't trust him, Betty. Where is he now? Down the hall in the guest room changing his wet clothes. His uh, chauffeur's with him. Chauffeur? Yes. That's not so good. What do you mean? Arthur's always used that chauffeur's uniform to disguise one of his thugs. Oh. What'll we do? Nothing. Shall I call the police? You can't, Betty. You know that. But, John, you told me that you could prove your innocence. I'm not until I get a written statement from a girl named Peggy Dawson. Who's she? Arthur White's ex-girlfriend, the one I told you about. Oh, yes. The one who sent me word in Mexico that White framed me. Well, when can you get that statement? She said she'd be here tonight, a little after midnight. But if she sees him here, she may change her mind about talking. John, she can't. Betty, 
Arthur has methods of persuading people. Then what can we do? You go down to the living room. Yes? Watch for this Dawson girl and head her off. All right. And above all, stay clear of that chauffeur. Uh, Jim, I sent out those flyers on John Williams. Oh, thanks, Clayton. I'm sorry to say that I don't have much to report. You get anything more from the Mexican police? Yes, uh, the chief called. They're yeah. covering every lead, but they still haven't found anything. Uh, you know, in going through Williams' record, I, I found he had a sister named Elizabeth. I went over to where she was living at the time of the trial, but she moved without leaving any forwarding address. I see. I did learn, however, that she owned a half interest in a freight warehouse. Here in town? Yeah, so I stopped in there on my way back to the office. How'd you make out? She sold out her interest about a year ago when she got married. Oh. You know, Glenn, if we could find Elizabeth Williams, I'm pretty sure we could find her brother. I'm inclined to agree. Have you sent out any alarm on her? Mm-hmm. You know, one thing bothers me about the records on this case. What's that? When the local police were investigating the original crime, they seemed to have met with some interference. What kind? Arthur White, political boss of this town. He apparently had pressure applied in saying to it that the city's investigation was ended. Well, Jim, how much do you know about this, White? Oh, I know a lot of things about him, Glenn. He's mixed up with mobs, mm -hmm. but he's pretty clever about concealing it. He's been an obstructionist in our path quite a few times, but we've never been able to definitely link him to any of the crimes. Well, it sounds like we'd be doing the taxpayers a real favor if we could prove that Williams came back to this country to see White. You know, that's what I was thinking, too, Glenn. I think I'll go over and have a talk with Mr. White. Come in. Well, Ed, I thought I'd lost you. I've been busy. Listen to this thing, Ed. You know what that is? It's that new stuff called bebop. <laughs> it's quite the rage these days for the younger set. I got a report for you. Oh? You've been casing the whole house. From the outside? Yeah. Your friend is in the corner room down the hall. Well, that's welcome news. How'd you find out? I climbed up a tree in the front yard and looked in the window. <laughs> Edward, you are a diligent man. Uh, what was my friend doing? Just getting into bed. I see. Well, I always say there's no time like the present. Strike while the iron's hot. <laughs> I always say that, too. You mean you want me to go in there now? That's right. <laughs> I think a gun will make too much noise. Yes, I agree with you. Have you a knife? Yeah. Well, <laughs> then use it, my boy. Use it. Okay. you'll find that you've only stabbed my pillow. We will return in just a moment to tonight's case from the files of your FBI. Right now, the bells of our colleges are ringing. Thousands of Americans of college age are answering the call. But what about those who do not go to college? What difference does that make in their lives? They are destined, on the average, to earn $72,000 less during their working years than the average college graduate. Yes, that's the price for not going to college. $72,000. Say, those kids of mine are going to college. If it takes the last cent I have to my name. Oh, it needn't do that, Sid, if you start an equitable education fund right now. Did you say an equitable education fund? Yes. It's a plan offered by the Equitable Life Assurance Society to make certain that your children get the funds necessary for the education you want them to have. Here are three things about the plan you should consider. First, you start when your children are young and spread their educational costs over 10 or 15 years instead of taking a licking in four. Second... When your boy or girl is ready for education, the money is ready and waiting for him right there in the Equitable Education Fund. Third, this equitable plan works whether you live or die. If you are totally or permanently disabled, the fund continues to build up without any further payments. 
If you die, the education fund becomes fully established immediately. That's what I need, Mr. Keating. I'm going to see someone from the Equitable Society. Right, Sid. Get in touch with your Equitable Society representative without delay. Or send a postcard, care of this station, to the Equitable Life Assurance Society. And remember, with the Equitable Life Assurance Society, you can be sure that when the college bells ring out in 1960 or 1965, your boy or girl will be ready to answer the call. And now back to the FBI file, The Innocent Fugitive. In regard to tonight's program, we bring you a message from Mr. J. Edgar Hoover, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Mr. Hoover says, and I quote, Tonight's case adapted from the files of your FBI is not to be regarded as an indictment of our political system. Our country lives by that system and has prospered by it. In the final analysis, our greatest men, Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, and all such national figures, were in politics. However, there is a sharp line of demarcation between the man in politics working always in the best interests of the citizen and the politician who thinks only about his job. Much of today's crime problem can be traced to the latter, the political hanger-on who wants a job as head of a police department for what he can get out of it. The crooked or ignorant vote-getter. The legislator who impedes law enforcement for private or political reasons is the type to which I refer. They are enemies of America and of every man in politics. You and I, the citizens of America, must see to it that politics is concerned with principles and careers. That every local government is run by men and women whose honorable intention it is to serve their fellow citizens. Tonight's file continues in the darkened bedroom of John Williams. Just stay where you are, mister. I have a gun here. I'm not moving. Well, see that you don't. And keep your hands up while I see what other weapons you're carrying. I ain't. I'll find that out myself. Okay. Satisfied? Turn around. Sit on the bed. Okay. Now, first of all, I want you to know one thing. Inasmuch as you came up here to kill me, I haven't any qualms at all about killing you. You understand? Yeah. You can walk out of here alive or be carried out dead. It's up to you. Up to me? How? I want you to go back and tell Arthur White you did your job. Huh? Tell him you killed me. Why? What's your angle? That's my business. Mister, I don't play any games where I don't know the score. You're in no position to make any demands. Can I have a couple of minutes to think it over? Sure. Thanks. Glenn. Hmm? Ready to take a trip? Where to, Jim? Lakeview Hills. Well, that's right near where Williams landed that plane, isn't it? That's right. What makes you think he's still up there? A couple of things I learned while I was out. What were they? Well, when I left here, I went over to Arthur White's apartment. Was he Uh, annoyed at being disturbed this late at night? No, he wasn't there. Well, who'd you talk to? To his houseboy. Mm -hmm. When I showed him my credentials, he told me that White and another man had gone to visit someone about an hour ago. Pretty late at night to be visiting, isn't it? Yeah, that's what I thought. He also described the other man, and from the description, it's Ed Franklin. Ed Franklin? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, I thought he was in jail for the murder of a policeman a few years ago. Well, it seems that Mr. Franklin has friends. He's been paroled. Jim, what do you have to do around here to be ineligible for parole? I'm sure I don't know. Oh, the houseboy also told me that Arthur White and Franklin were going to visit this friend at Lakeview Hills. Then he is meeting Williams. Looks that way. Our job now is to get up there and find them together. If we can do that, he'll have a pretty tough time explaining his way out. Yeah, but Jim, Lakeview Hills is a pretty big community. They might be meeting any place up there. Oh, I just received a report on William's sister. She's living in Lakeview Hills. Well, then all we have to do is locate her house. Yeah, but it's not going to be that easy. She married a year ago, and the report didn't uncover her new name. However, let's go up there and see what we can find on the spot. enough time to think? Yeah. What's your decision? I never double-crossed anybody in my life. I'm not going to start now. John 
dear, I... Oh. It's all right, Betty. What happened? Mr. White's chauffeur came in here thinking I was in bed. But I was waiting for him. Oh. He seems to have a curious code of honor. I don't understand. I want him to go back and tell White I'm dead. And he refuses to do it. Some guys are double crosses and some guys ain't. Now, look. Do you think Arthur White would be this loyal to you? He got me my parole. Uh, Probably so you could do this job for him. White would double cross his best friend. I know. I was his best friend. And he framed me. Are you kidding? White told me you ran away with $80,000 of the city's money. I didn't run away because of that $80,000. One night out at a roadhouse, White threw a party. There were a lot of us there. I got pretty drunk and got into a fight with the man. This man fell down, hit his head on the floor, and a doctor who was there pronounced him dead. So you ran away because you had a murder rap going against you. That's what I thought when I left. And that's what White wanted me to think. But the man I hit wasn't dead. The doctor was a phony. White wanted to get John out of the country. Why? Well, then he could take anything he wanted from the city treasury and make it look as if I had taken it and absconded. Huh? Why don't you go to the cops? Because he couldn't prove that the man he struck was still alive without the help of a girl named Peggy Dawson. Who's she? She knows the man I allegedly killed. She's coming here tonight to give me a written statement. Oh. Sounds like trouble for White. It is. He's going to jail. And unless you do as I asked, you're going with him. Now, what do you say? Mister, you just made a deal. No, you didn't. Huh? Drop that gun, John. Drop it. (laughs) Now, why don't we all go down to the living room and wait for Peggy Dawson? Elaine, I just phoned the office. They've been doing a further check on William's sister. Well? All they got is that she married a man from a place near here called Jamestown. Could they get his name? No, no, they couldn't. Well, when were they married? About a year ago, in Jamestown. Well, that means we'll have to go over there and search all those marriage licenses that have been issued in the last year. Well, the office called Jamestown. They won't open their license bureau until tomorrow morning. Can we wait that long? I'm afraid not. The meeting between White and Williams will undoubtedly be over by then. Mm. Then White goes back to town and he's done something again that we can't prove. Well, that means we've got to locate them tonight. That's right. Jim, Lakeview Hills is much too big to start a house-to-house canvas. Yeah, there's no question about that. Even with the help of the local police, we couldn't do it under a couple of days. Yeah, I know. I know. Hey, wait a minute. Let's go back to that telephone, Glenn. This is just like old times, huh, John? All of us sitting together in front of the fire. Uh, I miss those good old days. You mean you'd like to frame me again, huh? Why, John, I I don't know what you're talking about. You'll find out soon enough. How's that? When that girl gets here. Oh, you mean Peggy. Yes. She has definite proof that you framed John. So I gathered from what I heard when I eavesdropped upstairs... That was just before Ed here decided to play on your team. Look, I wasn't going to double-cross you. I heard different. I was just a routine. What else could I do? He had a gun. We'll debate that later. Now let's get back to Peggy's story, shall we, John? You've already heard it. I'd like to fill in a few details, though, that you don't even know. They concern the man you killed. Well? I don't think he'll be much help to you. He is alive, isn't he? Oh, yes, yes. (laughs) He's alive. But unfortunately for you, he has a past, a prison record. I had him paroled from prison. He's quite grateful for that. I think he'll show his gratitude by doing whatever I say. We'll still have the word of that girl. But she won't be talking. Yes, she will. From the grave, John? What do you mean? She's coming here tonight, isn't she? I'm going to give Ed here a chance to redeem himself. You mean kill her? (laughs) Well, bluntly, yes. John, you've got to do something. You've got to keep that girl from coming here. <gasps> oh. A little late, aren't you? Let her in, Ed. Okay. No, no, don't. Stand back, you. Huh? Let me have that gun, Mr. White. What? what? Who are you? I'm a special agent of the FBI. Oh, oh. Well, I'm glad to give you the gun. Here. Uh, I'm certainly happy you men got here when you did. I 
I stopped at this farmhouse to ask directions, and that man there pulled a gun on me. Luckily, Little I was able... Why? I think I know what happened here. That's why we brought warrants for the arrest of you, Williams, as well as Mr. White. But John is innocent. He can prove it. If he can, I'm sure he'll be released. Is it all right if I go? I'm Mr. White's chauffeur. Yes. Yes, you can go. You can go with the rest of us, Franklin. We've got a big car outside, big enough to take us all to headquarters. <laughs> John Williams was cleared of all charges and the city made restitution. Arthur White was turned over to local authorities and sentenced to a long prison term on charges of bribery. Ed Franklin's parole was revoked and he was returned to prison. The last telephone call that Special Agent Jim Taylor made was to the editor of the local newspaper, the Jamestown Record. He gave that gentleman the facts and asked him to check the files of the newspaper in an effort to locate the marriage notice of Elizabeth Williams. Upon checking, the editor found that Miss Williams had married a man named Martin Leroy and that she was now a widow. With that information, Special Agents Taylor and Peters located the residence leased by Mrs. Leroy and apprehended Arthur White and Ed Franklin. Thus, your FBI once more was instrumental not only in apprehending a criminal but in helping to prove the innocence of an accused man. The files of your FBI are replete with cases of similarly innocent men being cleared, and the Federal Bureau of Investigation points with pride to those cases, for they are constant living proof of the lengths to which every special agent is trained to go to protect your personal liberty. In just a moment, we will tell you about next week's exciting case from the files of your FBI. Now, Sid, I've got just a few seconds to answer your question on the Equitable Education Fund. Uh, Mr. Keating, is there any special amount you have to sign up for when you start one of these funds? No, Sid. The amount is strictly up to you, whatever you feel you can afford. Your Equitable Society representative will work out a plan that's tailor-made for your income and the educational requirements for your family. So why not plan to see him soon? Or send a postcard care of this station to the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The dramatic story of two thieves that a dead man helped to convict. Its subject, extortion. Its title, The Unknown Voice. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Unknown Voice on This Is Your FBI. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.